Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a little early because the keynote got out a little early, so I was waiting a few minutes for people to file in, but I think you guys are all here now, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, first off, I'm Kevin Gibbs. I'm the tech lead for Google App Engine. Um, so I've come out here to the developer day because I want a chance to meet you guys, and I want you guys to be able to talk to me and tell me more about what you want and what you need and give me any hard or interesting or easy questions on App Engine that I can help you with. Um, so today I'm going to walk through a presentation about App Engine. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's behind it, uh, why we made it, why we built App Engine, uh, what it's like to run an application on App Engine, um, what the code for that application looks like, and if anything else uh, sort of that's in the life cycle of using App Engine. But I want to leave a lot of time open for questions, because really the, the point of me coming out here uh, from Mountain View to see you guys is so that you can ask these questions, and I can tell you guys more about App Engine. So please, uh, I'll try to leave a lot of time open for questions, but please don't be shy and ask away. Today, after this presentation, uh, we'll also be having a code lab where you can go, uh, you can join us in the code lab and actually write an App Engine application. We'll be able to step you through doing so, uh, give you tips on how to do it, give you an example to work through. And myself um, and someone else from the App Engine engineering team will be there to help you out, as well as other people to help you out with any questions or any other technical details you might have. So um, that'll be after this. And then later in the afternoon, there will be an advanced App Engine talk where we'll talk a little bit more about advanced scalability stuff that you might want to do for very scalable App Engine apps. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, real quick before I get started, how many of you have used App Engine before or created an App Engine app? Anybody? Three or four of you? Cool. Uh, well, no, that's about what I would expect. Uh, I'm going to... All right, so I'll get started. So. First, right off the bat, what is Google App Engine? Well, being succinct, Google App Engine is a system for running your web applications on Google's scalable infrastructure. For the first time with Google App Engine, we're actually exposing to you the building blocks that we use at Google to build our massively scalable apps so you can use them within your apps. Um, but to, to get a little bit beyond that, I'm going to go, I want to tell you a little bit about why we created App Engine. Now, you heard uh, during the keynote a little bit about this, but I want to dive in a little more detail. Why did I, why did my team think that it was necessary to build a new way of running web applications? What, what were the problems that we saw? Well, as you heard, today it's actually pretty difficult to create and run a web application. Even for just a tiny web application that you create, there's a lot of technical hurdles that you have to accomplish to serve it and share it with the world. First, you have to write the code for your application. But as I imagine most all of your programmers, that's not actually a big concern. That's something you expected to do and that you're used to doing. But after you've written the code, you have a number of other things you have to do for a web application. You have to set up your Apache server, set up your SQL database, hook those two up, set up the passwords for running between those, create your tables, set up the scripts for the Linux machine to keep it running, set up a way to SSH in new copies of your code, find a way to monitor that machine so you know when it crashes, on and on and on, to get the machine up and running so you can serve your code. So that's the first step that you have, the first challenge you encounter in creating a web app today. It's a technical challenge. The second big challenge you have is once you've done all of that, you have to find somewhere to run that stack that you put together of those servers, configurations, and code. You have to go find somewhere to run it. And that means machines, right? That means either machines that you have from a hosting provider or possibly a machine at home on your DSL line or in your business. But that usually means one other thing. That means that you have to pay somebody something. Because usually it costs something to run those machines and keep them going. So even for the smallest app, one that you just created in the afternoon, you have to pay someone to get it up and running to just share it with people and just try it out. So those are the first two challenges in creating a web app. You've got the technical challenge and the financial challenge. But the third challenge, in my opinion, as an engineer, is the worst one, and that's to maintain this. If you guys, how many of you have run a website before, run a web application in any form? You guys, I'm sure there's more than three of you guys. Don't be shy. 
uh, at least a good number of you. I don't know about you guys, but in my experience, I run a few that are not affiliated with Google, you know, in my private time. It's always breaking. I mean, during the keynote today, I was SSHing into a machine that I have somewhere because the logs overran on the mailing list, caused the SQL Server to stop working, and it ran out of space on the root partition, and so forth. Um, those sort of things of maintaining the system to keep it running, I think, are a pretty significant hassle. Even that, though, beyond just maintaining what you need to get the system running, it only gets worse when your app starts to grow. I think I've ever had an application get very popular or begin to scale to a much larger number of users, you have, usually have to re-architect the application. It means starting to scale your SQL servers, finding a way to run multiple servers for your front-end code, hooking those up, getting more machines, setting up a way for all of those uh, machines to connect and communicate with each other, and on and on. So when it starts to grow and your app starts to scale, that's perhaps the biggest challenge of keeping it working. So all of these hassles, all of these hassles that we saw in creating a small application uh, and taking that up to a larger application were the things that we wanted to address with App Engine. Now, the other key thing about, um, about Google App Engine is that it runs your applications on Google's infrastructure. Now, why I think that's important, why I think that's interesting is that at Google, we've created a lot of web applications that are pretty big, that have a lot of users. You guys have probably used a lot of them. And we think that in the process of building those applications, we've learned a few things. We've learned some things that work and some things that don't, and we've built a lot of systems that have helped us get there. Um, you know, if you think of some of our applications, take Google Maps, um, and you think of all the satellite data it has in there, all of the route data, all of the imagery, how it has to put all of those together and serve those uh, gigabytes and gigabytes of map tiles. It's a pretty large app, and it gets a lot of traffic. Take, on the other hand, something like Google Translate, which has to run machine translation algorithms on millions, if not billions, of documents regularly, which takes a huge amount of computing power. And Google, we have to figure out how to do that efficiently and how to make all of that run. And of course, there's also Google Search, right? You put in any phrase or any word, it drills down through all of the web's documents and returns instantly with the result. So, you know, with Google's infrastructure, we think that we've, we've got some things that make it easier to do a web application and easier to scale it. And the other big asset is that at Google, we have a network of data centers in multiple locations across the world in many countries. And as part of doing business at Google, we have to maintain these data centers, keep them healthy, build them, connect them, and have them sort of as a, uh, a backdrop for everything that we do. Now, this huge network of data centers in the world is beyond the reach of most companies. It's beyond what most people could afford to do is it's extremely expensive. Every quarter, Google spends millions and millions of dollars maintaining these data centers. But with App Engine for the first time, you can run your applications in these same scalable data centers and get to benefit from all that work that we do to keep those healthy and keep them serving to the world in a good fashion. So from all of that leads to sort of the three main design goals that we had in building Google App Engine. They were one, let's make it easy to use. Let's make it as easy as possible to go from an idea of a web, web application and writing the code and getting it running, giving it out to people. Let's remove all those hassles, if we can, that we talked about in the beginning. Second, uh, let's make it easy to scale. By easy to scale, I mean that we don't think you should have to re-architect your web application once or many times as it starts to grow and get more traffic. You know, if you read online, you can read articles from startups where when they begin to get popular, they had to keep rebuilding their architecture over and over again, doing new things each time. And it's a huge drain on their productivity, and it, it really reduces how quickly they can get new users and get to market. And finally, we thought it was important to make it free to get started. As a software engineer myself, that is, is a big deal. If I can go home and I have an idea on the weekend and I want to create it, if I can put it together and launch that app engine and I didn't have to pay anyone anything or do anything special, that made a big difference for me in how I would create web apps. All right, well, so those are, I've given you a little bit about a more detail on why we created App Engine and what the design motivations were behind App Engine. Now I'd like to talk to you a bit more about the five major components of App Engine. What's behind App Engine and what makes App Engine unique in uh, what it is today? The first of those components is our scalable serving architecture. Now, this is a picture from our data center uh, that I took with John before we left and came over here to Europe. That's not true. Um, our scalable serving architecture is 
sort of the key component of App Engine. App Engine is a system that serves web applications. And we try to scale those web applications for you. What that means is that we take your code and we handle everything of getting the user's request in their browser down to a running instance of your code. All of that is handled for you, and there's nothing you need to configure or set up. So when you send your code to Google through App Engine, your code is immediately pushed to a distributed set of fault-tolerant servers running in data centers around the world. And as requests come in, we're connecting it to those machines. Any one of them can fail at any time, but your application will continue to be served. At the same time, as traffic is coming to your application, if it, the traffic grows and your application gets more popular, we're fluidly moving the application around and increasing the number of servers it's on. Basically, with App Engine, you never have to reserve anything. You never have to say, well, I need three machines for my application, or one machine, or 800. Instead, we linearly and fluidly scale that out to meet your needs. So, with that, I thought I'd show you a little bit more about behind the scenes of how App Engine works, how the scalable serving infrastructure works. And you know, I think it's pretty important because it's something that's uh, pretty unique to App Engine. Rather than trying to give you something that's more of just a generalized computing solution or something that just takes you know, machine images or runs big compute jobs, we're actually specifically handling the problem of running web applications and scaling them. So our scaling uh, serving architecture behind the scenes works like this. As a request starts coming from the user's web browser or a phone or uh, iPhone or Android, or possibly from a social network such as Facebook or Orchid or, My, or, uh, excuse me, or MySpace, for, or from a web service or anything else, when the request comes in, it hits the Google Data Center and then goes to the App Engine front end. Now the front end process knows about all of our application servers within the data center. The application servers are where your code actually runs. And the front end knows how to connect your request to the appropriate app server that has a running instance of your application. The load balancer, in turn, is watching these app servers and noticing how traffic's coming in and adjusting your application in real time if it needs more resources as your traffic grows. Within a single app server, when we're serving requests, your applications run within the app server in an isolated container. Inside of this isolated container, your application has access to our API layer. The API layer is what gives you access to the various APIs that we expose within App Engine, such as our persistent data store, um, the account system, memcache, basically anything else that you need access to. And it manages all of that for you. So again, you don't have to set it up or configure it. It just works out of the box. Okay, so that's the first of our components, which are scalable serving architecture. Our second big component is our distributed data store. Our data store is a scalable object store, which scales to holding millions of objects with uh, untold tens and hundreds of millions of properties. Now, our data store, unlike other systems that you may have used, is not based on SQL. Instead, it's based on Bigtable. Bigtable is a technology that we developed at Google to be our storage layer for many of our applications. And it's pretty fascinating. Um, there are paper, published academic papers on it online. You can read them if you're interested. It's, it's a very interesting read. Um, but to describe Bigtable quickly, Bigtable is a horizontally scalable distributed system that manages serving uh, objects from data in a sorted array. The data that Bigtable serves spans thousands of servers and tens of thousands of disks. And Bigtable automatically notices hot spots in the access patterns of your data and shifts them around, moving them to other machines and extending the scale. What all that means is that Bigtable can handle a tremendous amount of data. It's not limited by one machine. It runs on, again, thousands and thousands of machines. So your application is now longer, no longer constrained by the scale of a SQL database or even a sharded SQL database. It fluidly grows with your application. Now, because our data store is based on Bigtable and not SQL, it's going to mean that there are a few things that are different for you. There are a few things that when you write an application on App Engine will take a little getting used to. Um, but we think that once you get started with it, once you try it out, you may actually come to like it. Um, there are a few things about our data store which actually uh, are a little bit easier to use than SQL and a little bit exciting. For instance, since Bigtable and our data store is schema-less, 
That means that you can introduce a new type, a new data type, or a new property on an existing type just by modifying your code. You don't have to do a schema upgrade or change all of your tables. Basically, as you use your code and start putting data in is how the system works and how your application works. Now, I mentioned that um, we're not SQL. Well, what do we provide? What is the API that you use for accessing our data store? Well, I, it's a, a pretty powerful API. I would argue that it offers everything that you need for a typical web application. It supports queries on a single property or multiple properties. It supports sort orders on the results of those queries, again, on a single property or multiple properties. You can create indices on any set of properties and sort orders, which allow you to do arbitrary queries very efficiently. It supports specifying the primary key, uh, doing batch operations, having transactions so you can guarantee uh, the outcome of your operations, and a number of other features. However, the big thing that our data store doesn't support, which you might be used to, is joins. The reason why our data store doesn't support joins is because joins are fundamentally um, don't work well in distributed systems. Joins generally depend on the memory of a single database making certain interactions efficient when looking at the indices. And when you move them to a horizontally scalable system that runs on many machines, they tend to not be as efficient. Um, but you'll actually see that for many systems, when they do start to scale their application out so it can handle tremendous amounts of loads and tremendous number of users, they have to remove their joins from the database. So this is something that often happens in application development. So with that said, I'd like to show you a little bit more about our, um, our data store. What does it look like to use the App Engine data store? Well, this is an example class for interacting with the data store. It's a, a model class, which specifies how you will create a specific object and what properties that object has. Now, this class is just a normal Python class, if you've programmed with Python before. There's nothing special about it. We say here that the type of data I'm working with is a shout. In this example, uh, imagine that this data would be used for uh, a little message board application where you would put shout outs to your friends. So I say it inherits from our database model. And then I just declare the properties that I want the object to have in the database. Here I've declared three. The message, the user sent, who the message is from, and when the message was posted. Now, the message itself, I said, will be a string property. I didn't also mention that it will be required. So whenever I create one, I'll make sure that there is a message present. The who property, I've also said will be a string, but it's not required. So it's optional, and the name is free form. You can put in whatever you want for the name. And the when, I've said, is a date time property. The data store also supports a number of rich types, and we handle uh, doing sorting on those properly and getting them in and out of the data store for you. In this case, I've said that I'll automatically set it to the current time for you when the, the object is created. So that's it. If you type that code into an App Engine application, you're already storing your data on Bigtable. You're able to query and get it back and work with it. Now, although our data store is not based on SQL, we do provide something called GQL, which is a SQL-like SQL query language, which allows you to work with the data store. Now, the benefit of GQL is sort of in the spirit of uh, jQuery or FBQL, if you've worked with those before. It basically allows you to do queries in a language that you're familiar with, even though we don't support all of SQL. So here's an example query. Here I'm saying I'll select star from shout. That's the class that you saw me create before, uh, where the person uh, the, who wrote it is Brad. It's a string literal. And I'll order them by the time when descending. And fetch the first hundred of this. So that's it. That's how you would interact with, that's how you do interact with the data store in App Engine. Um, and I think that, uh, sort of, this, the way that this uses Bigtable, it's not, I hope, too challenging for many of your applications. It's not too different from what you're used to. But it's pretty exciting when you think about it. By simply using a system like this, rather than having your scalability limited by a single database, instead your application is now ready if you've thought it through a little bit when you created it ready to scale to millions upon millions of users without you having to change a line of code. So if you get slash dotted, that's great, that's fine. Your application should hopefully be able to keep up with the traffic. All right, so that's the second big component of App Engine. What's the third big component? Well, the third component is our Python runtime and libraries. A Python is the first runtime language that we support with App Engine. App Engine is modular. It supports multiple runtime languages, but Python is the first one that we've launched with. In running 
Python code on App Engine, uh, you have few, if any, restrictions. We estimate that maybe 95% of Python libraries off the shelf, and there's a wealth of them out there, will run unmodified on App Engine. And further, you can use any sort of web framework you want for programming your application, any sort of library. You can return any sort of HTML or CSS. You can make a web service, or you can make an end user application or AJAX application. We don't try to constrain how you use App Engine or what goes into it. We just take a response in HTTP and return it back to the user. Um, yeah, I think that's mostly it about, the, about Python. Our fourth big component for App Engine is our open source SDK. Well, the SDK, I think, is pretty exciting. And as sort of mentioned before, with App Engine, we're integrating all the tasks of creating a web application. We're providing you a new life cycle, a new way of doing things. Um, and within that life cycle, the SDK plays a big role. The SDK emulates our server-side stack on your local machine. It's written in pure Python, so you can run it on any platform that you have, Mac, Windows, Linux. But it allows you to write your applications on your local machine with our server-side APIs and have an incredibly short code, compile, test cycle, meaning that you can just run your application, change a line of code, and then hit reload in your browser and instantly see the results. Just pretty refreshing. You no longer have to wait about redeploying it every time you want to try a change or waiting for it to update. You just develop locally and move very quickly. Um, and it's part of that life cycle of making it, of, of trying to contain all of the things that you need to do for an application. When you're ready to deploy the application with the SDK, you just run a command line. You say, I can take update. And the application is deployed to Google and it's already running. And this right here is our launcher application, which is from Mac OS X, which sort of contains these functions and makes it easier to do with a, a GUI way. You can hit the deploy button, you see the dashboard, and view the logs, and so forth. Now, the fifth big component uh, of App Engine is our web based administration console. And this is sort of the other half of that life cycle that I was telling you about in providing the, the whole life cycle of web applications. It's a web-based UI that allows you to see all of the vital stats and do basic operations on your application when it's running on App Engine. So for instance, you can go and see what the traffic is, how much traffic you've been receiving. You can see about quotas like CPU and bandwidth, how much you've used. You can see which URLs are getting requests. You can read your logs. You can perform some database administration commands using uh, executing GQL commands and so forth. So it sort of gives you uh, the window into your application running on App Engine. All right, so with all of that said, I'd like to now step you through an example app on App Engine so you can see what it actually looks like for a whole application and what's the code behind it. So the first file that goes into an App Engine application that sort of ties it together is the app.yaml configuration file. This is a file which lives in the root directory of your application, of the, the directory that defines your app. And it's a simple text-based config file which states some basic things about your application. The first one is the application ID. In this case, I said I'll have my ID be shout-out for my shout-out example app. Now, the application ID is just an, an ID that you create for getting access to the app. But we give uh, a URL for your application at the application ID.appspot.com. So you can start using it instantly without buying a domain. You can also use third party domains with App Engine. You can also specify which version of the application this is. App Engine supports having multiple running, version of your app, running versions of your application. So that you can have one version which is live, which is receiving all of your traffic, and another version which is your debug or develop version for testing things out, and so forth. The other major section in the app.yaml file is the handler section. The handler section tells the App Engine system how to direct traffic that comes from your comes to your application to your code files. So in this case, I have a really trivial one. I said all requests that come in using this regular expression will go to my main.py file. But you can also break this out into separate files, have specific admin handlers, control serving as static files, and a number of other features. But let's go ahead and take a look at that main.py file that drives this out. The first thing that goes into that main file is the data model. Now, I took you through this data model example before when we were going through the data store slides, and this defines the data that we're going to use in my example application. 
This example application is, a, again, just a little message board where you can post shout outs from someone to someone else. So this defines what I'll put in there, the who, the content, and when it was posted. Now the other main thing that goes into this is the request handlers. If you've developed a web app before, you know that usually you have to write some code that says, for a request coming in, how you'll turn those HTTP query parameters and the input headers into the response that you want to return to the user, usually in HTML. So that's what this does. Here I've defined two handlers, the get and the post verbs for the basic slash handler on my application. For the get handler, I said that what I'll do is I'll take the, uh, do a query against our data store where I select the shouts and order them by, by the posting time, which is on our example query. And then this result will just hold those entities that I fetched from the data store. And then I'll put those entities into this values array, this map, and pass it into our template rendering system. Now, AppEngine ships with the Django framework and the Django template rendering system, which is an open source one that we tried out and we liked. But you can use any template system you want on AppEngine. In this case, I'll just take those values, basically the, the set of shout objects that I got from the data store, and render my main HTML file with it. Then I'll write that out into the response that I'm going to send to the user. Now that's the get handler, which serves when someone when the browser sends a get request, such as for slash or something. Here I also am going to define a post handler, and that's what happens when someone submits a form usually. For the post handler, I'm going to accept the shout that someone types in, and then I'm going to actually put that into the data store so I can query it and get it back and show it on the get page. So it's pretty easy to do. All I had to do here was I created an instance of the shout class. This is how you do class instantiation in Python. And then I said, well, who will equal the who query argument from the request, and the content will equal the content query argument from the request. Then I create the shout object, and I issue a put command. The put command places it in the data store, so I can get it back later or do a query on it. Then after that, I say, oh, I'll redirect back to slash, so the users will have a display of the, the shouts. And finally, the only other component of this simple web app is the HTML template, which displays the data to the user. You saw we, we used that template command to render it before. So here's an example HTML template. You can see it just says my guest book, and I've got a simple form for getting the data from the user for a shout. And this is the actual uh, interactive part of the template. You can see it's a simple sort of for loop. I'm going to loop over those shouts that I fetched from the data store in the earlier step. And here I'm just going to write them out in a div, one per shout, where I say, well, the content, the shout from someone, from, and who posted it at the time they posted it. That's it. So it's going to loop through those and output all of them, and then I'll have a, a page that displays this. So that's it. And then once you've written that, you're done. You can try it out locally with the SDK to make sure it works right and get over you know, any syntax errors you might have. And then you just deploy to Google, and your app's already running. Now, I'll go ahead here and actually show you what that looks like. I've got uh, Emacs open here. So here's that same example app that we just talked about there. Here's the app.yaml file that I defined. And here is the main.py file. This one's all basically the same stuff we talked about, about that shout class we defined. Here are those handlers, the get and the post handler. And the main is just how you get the, the app started. So without working, with that all written out there, I can now go ahead and try it out. So here, I can run the dev app server, which is part of our SDK that, that emulates an app server and allows you to run it locally with my shoutout app. So I hit that, and now it's running. And now if I go over to, one, to this page, I can actually go ahead and try it out. I can load up that app and see what it looks like. So I'll go to localhost, okay. and there you go. There's a the shout out. I can test it out. Say, so, well, this is from Kevin to John. There it goes. And I can quickly jump back over here and make a change. So maybe I said and said that I want to change the um, the template. So I'll change the template so it says. Um, Supposedly from, because it's not really authenticated. So I save it, you reload, and there you go. So now I've got my web app running. It's working here and I like it. 
And you can see I changed it supposedly, so I'm going to go ahead and deploy it to Google. Now, doing that's pretty easy. I just come over here, I'll exit the dev app server, and then I run the app config utility, which is how you deploy to Google. So I'll say update this shout out app again. And right now it's being pushed to Google. There we go. Now it's actually running on Google servers. So because I gave it the app ID shout out pro, I can actually go ahead and hit it here. And this is running on Google. You could hit this and try it out. So I'll say this is from Kevin to and there you go. You see it's got that latest change that I made. So that's how it works with that engine. It's it's pretty easy. We're trying to really remove all those barriers so you get back into just writing code again and deploying apps. Hopefully making it a lot more fun. So to jump back into my presentation, there you have it. And it's deployed in the app spot URL. Now I've talked about a couple of the APIs in App Engine thus far. I've talked about the, the data store API and how the scale the scalable serving infrastructure works. We have a number of other APIs in App Engine too though. One of them is the memcache API. The Memcache API is used by a lot of applications uh, that are trying to write, a lot of people who are trying to write scalable applications. It's a distributed memory cache, which allows you to basically take something, put it in the cache, and quickly get it back from any instance of your application. So it allows you to make your app even faster by caching data or pages that you want for a quicker display. You have the ability to send email. All you have to do is compose a mail message and put in the address that you want to send it to, and it will send immediately to that person. It uses Google's mail delivery infrastructure, so you have a pretty good guarantee that it'll actually get there to the user. You don't have to set up mail servers again or anything like that. There's another API which allows you to make outgoing HTTP requests. These HTTP requests allow you to, for instance, fetch an RSS feed or use a web service as part of another app. Finally, you can also authenticate with Google accounts, which is a nice feature. If you want to start up an application, you don't want to have to create all of that um, boilerplate code to have people create accounts and then change their email for their account when they change it or when they lost the password. You can use Google accounts instead, and they can use the same account that they use with Gmail to log into your app. You don't have to manage any of that. And there's also an image manipulation API. If you have an application which accepts images, you need to create thumbnails or resize images or do stuff like that, the image manipulation API will take care of it for you. Now, with all of that said, I do want to mention again one point, uh, which you probably heard at the keynote, that App Engine is in a preview release. We launched App Engine about six months ago now, um, and since then it's been doing really well. We've seen a lot of big apps come along, and some examples you saw today, and many others. But we launched it early because we wanted to get your feedback. We really do. That's why I'm here. I want to hear what you guys want out of App Engine, what you think it needs, how, uh, how it's been meeting your needs. So please, when you use it, think about it and let us know what you want. Post on the groups and the forums and the issue tracker and help us so that we can evolve App Engine to be the product that you need for running your web apps. So what's next with App Engine? Well, we have a list of the, a few things that we're working on here and uh, we've been working towards. SSL support, something we're working on, just been launched. We've got some other things that are going on. But I'm actually excited to tell you that this morning, we actually, for the first time, and you guys are the first to hear it, publicly posted our product, our product roadmap. So now, for those of you who are excited about App Engine and you want to know what we're going to do next, you can actually see, with some very rough dates of when we plan to offer these features, what we're going to be offering to you with App Engine, what our team is working on in the Google offices. Now, in the past, Google hasn't really done this because we know that software development is full with a lot of variables and it's very hard to predict. We don't want to set expectations where we can't meet them. But we also respect that if you guys are, develop are developing on App Engine and want to depend on our platform, you need to know where it's going. You need to know what we're doing next. So this is our effort for showing that. And you can see the things that we've done since our launch, the features that we have launched, and what we're working on next. Now, some of those big things that we're working on are, one, a way of serving and storing really large files. So if you want to write an application that makes use of media files, such as MP3s or videos or large photos, we want to make it easier for running that particular type of website and make it efficient. 
We also want to provide a tool to help you work with really large data stores. If your application gets really big and you want to import or export a lot of data from it, or maybe you want to take an export of the data to back it up outside of App Engine, these tools can help you do that. We're also working hard at providing billing to you guys, a way that you can pay for more usage on App Engine. Today, App Engine is free to use to get started, and it will always be free to use for you to get started. But we want to allow you to be able to pay to get even more quota and run even bigger apps on App Engine. And finally, we're also working on support for a new runtime language and working on an uptime monitoring site so that you can see um, what our uptime stats have been for App Engine, any API that's had any outages or problems, and sort of track closely how App Engine's working so you know that you can depend on it for your websites. So, yeah, that's it. That's my presentation. And that's App Engine in a nutshell. So now I'm going to go over to questions to hopefully hear some more from you guys. So please, let me have them. Let me know what you think. I think I've got a microphone here to hand around. And this, by the way, this is John McAllister, who's one of the engineers from the App Engine team. He'll be giving the advanced App Engine talk this afternoon. Uh, so, I'll hand it over to you. Maybe you can help me hand it to the next person. Thanks. Hi. Oh, hello. Okay. Uh, which uh, new runtime languages you going to support? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can Which uh, runtime, runtime languages do you Oh, uh, which language? So we haven't announced uh, which language we're working on. What language would you like to see? I would like to see C Sharp. That's oh, right. I would like to see C Sharp, but I don't expect you, plan, you, you are working C -sharp. on it. C Sharp. Oh, that's cool. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot of requests on that question. A lot, of, a lot of different languages. And that's part of this uh, the system where we want to get feedback from you guys and see what you want, see what people are requesting. Um, there are a lot of threads on the groups and a lot of issues on the issue tracker where people have posted which different languages they're interested in or looking towards. Um, but yeah, now we are working on other language support on App Engine. Right now we're trying to make sure that we can launch another language in this time frame, but we haven't announced which language that is. You cannot say which? Language. Well, I, I just, I, again, I don't want to promise on something that we, we can't deliver for sure. So we are working on other language support, but at this time, we don't know which language that we'll be able to launch at that point. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> oh, sorry? Oh, uh, so John can help us out there. So we, within our free quotas, we have documented what you can do. Um, but the basic thing is our free quotas try to allow you to run an application with about 5 million page views. Now, page views, if you run a big web app, um, there's a little bit of a flexible thing. Hits mean a, a view of an actual page, but page views tend to be a user using the page, echo. Um, so we're attempting to give you enough resources to run a reasonable app with 5 million page views. That actually breaks down to a few different things. We allow you 500 megabytes of storage to get started. Um, you can send about 2,000 emails a day and have 10, gigabit, 10 gigabytes of bandwidth in and out and so forth. But you can read more about this online to figure out what you need. In general, your app can actually run really far within those free quotas because uh, 5 million page views is a pretty big app. So, I will overload this limit. Oh, sorry? I will overload this limit. You will turn off. Are we going to, going to do what, sir? I will overload this limit. For example, I have uh, 200, 2,000 emails per day. Oh, sure. Set 1,100. Sure. So, you will turn off this service or? so we have announced, uh, although, as I mentioned on our roadmap, we're working on billing. So we're working on launching that to you so you can get larger quotas for your application. We have announced what the pricing is for most of these things already. And we're hoping to launch billing to you within this time frame. After that point, then yes, you'll be able to pay more for each one of those resources and grow your app hopefully as large as you might want to. And uh, a more direct answer to your question is that when you exceed quotas, you'll either exceed it on an individual API call or just on the incoming request. And if it's an individual API call, if you're exceeding it within your Python code, we're going to throw a Python exception. And you can then catch. And so you can like display some like nice usable uh, error message when that occurs. But sometimes you exceed it just from the incoming request, like a bandwidth quote or something like that. In which case we're gonna return a four or three. But generally our quotas like they'll refill over some period of time. They're not like a monthly quota or a daily <coughs> quota, they're over multiple time ranges. And so yeah. 
Do we Make sure it's a good answer. Do we intend to? Okay. Uh, sorry. Do we intend to integrate uh, Google Google accounts authentication with OpenID? Oh, yeah, actually, Google Apps Authentication is already integrated. So you can actually, when creating an application, say what domain you want it to be placed on, and use that auth within the app. Um, you can sorry. OpenID. Oh, sorry, OpenID, excuse me, I misread. OpenID, I think people have been working on various efforts using OpenID on App Engine. Um, and I believe it's possible to do today. Uh, I haven't really tracked those efforts very closely, but you can look online and you should be able to find some open source efforts about that. OK, you, sh you showed us uh, the local application server. Uh, is it possible to run the uh, local application server in my own cluster? So that's a great question. Um, the, the local application cluster is intended right now for sort of running a test instance on your machine. So it's not very scalable or very efficient. For instance, the data store implementation is just in memory within the process. So it wouldn't really be appropriate for running an app within your own cluster. However, there are people who have been really interested in taking our APIs and taking the SDK and making it something that you could use to run an application in your own cluster or externally. And that's something that we're really excited about. We're really excited in supporting those efforts and getting it there. And I really hope that pretty soon that there will be a stack for doing that so that you can easily run an app, an app engine application on Google's clusters or on your own. Thanks. And second question I would like to ask, um, do you provide some, something like GB, GDBC driver for your, uh, for your data store? A GDB, you mean a, a, a debugger? Sorry, I mean, uh, okay, I think in Java intentions, so uh, Java uh, database driver just to, uh, just to use, use your data store. If we a Java runtime language, would we use GDBC with, within that implementation? Oh, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I can't really, I'm not really sure how that would work. I mean, I think that any system that runs an app engine is going to be based off big table. It's going to be based off our data store because our APIs are modular. So for each, each language that we support, we hook in those modular APIs. But for each language, we've been trying to use the, the most native way possible, the most natural way to hook it in that works well with these abstractions. So I think you'll see it will vary with different runtimes, what's appropriate and how it works. Are you going to add uh, Google Web Toolkit integration? Google Web Toolkit? Oh, um, so it's possible today. So normally Google Web Toolkit relies upon Java. Um, but it's also possible to create Google Web Toolkit applications where you create the, the UI using Google Web Toolkit and then run it on App Engine. Some applications already do that today. For instance, there is a, was an application recently launched on App Engine called Google, Google Moderator. And Google Moderator allows you to sort of do an interactive Q&A, so you can vote up questions up and down. That UI was built with GWT, and it runs on App Engine. Uh, so do you have a question? Yeah, uh, what's the support of uh, Google App Engine in current uh, IDEs? I, I saw Emacs and... Sure. Like a sure. We saw Emacs because that was that was me using it. Normally a C programmer, but um, there are a lot of different IDs that you can use with App Engine. I think that you know, for Python developers, there's not a single IDE that I've seen that is like the most popular amongst Python developers. So it sort of varies. But I know there are people who use IDEs with App Engine and various uh, open source projects going on to hook in appropriate IDEs. But it sort of varies on your IDE and how you want to hook it up. For example, you know, I don't know if there is, uh, I don't remember if there is an, an open source project yet for an Eclipse setup. It is possible to use Eclipse with App Engine, though. I've seen someone do it before. But I don't know, you might have to look around online to see. I have a question regarding the distributed resources. Uh, would it be possible to use Google APIs and the distributed resources at the same time for my application that would be distributed? So I would like to write parallel and distributed application with Google APIs. APIs, sorry. Oh, okay, so you mean you'd like to use Google APIs within a, an App Engine application? Is that what you mean? Uh, excuse me. Okay. Say it again, please. Oh, uh, would you like to use uh, the Google Data APIs within App Engine? Is that your question? 
Uh, I would like. I am interested in parallel and distributed computations, and and I am asking. You have a distributed. Oh, I see. Warehouse. We're doing yes. more just like com computation jobs on App Engine. Yes. That's a great question. Um, so that's something that we don't really have available today. App Engine today is focused around writing web applications, and that's part of the reason why we're in a preview release. You know, I think that. For App Engine to, in the fullest realization of App Engine, we're going to have to have some great ways of doing offline computation, of doing processing a lot of data. So if you have a big data store in your application with millions and millions of entities, you could iterate over all of them, you know, come up with an aggregation or do processing of a lot of data. But that work, um, that offline processing work, is something that we're actively investigating now. Um, so it's something where we really want to hear your feedback again. What sort of uh, a processing would you like to do? And to tell us about that so we can know about that. But as of right now, App Engine doesn't support that. There are ways that you can do it for doing some basic offline processing. But uh, we do hope to eventually to provide much better tools for doing batch processing with App Engine. Uh, yes? What is the. By oh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the question. Um, yeah, GQL, so GQL is just a query language. So GQL only is a, basically takes a query that you formulate and applies it to the data store. Does that answer your question? Uh, did you hear that? Which stores one of our core APIs for sorry. storage and indexing the data? Well, it's more like an interface to query from the data store. G12, not independent data store. It's the same thing. Some more questions? Come in. Uh, do you have some limits? How long does it take to allow? Oh, uh, how long? Just saying, uh, transport five minutes. That's actually a great question. We do have some limits there. Uh, and you know, to answer, well, I'll skip the, the diagram. We do have some limits within how you process a request within App Engine because App Engine is based around web apps and trying to make web apps scale and be great for a great experience for users and being fast. So in general, we have CPU limits on every request of how much CPU you can use. Now initially, these per request CPU limits um, are not enforced. Initially, you can use a little bit over that, and that's okay. And if you do so occasionally, you know, uh, like one or two times a minute, that's fine. Your application will continue to run well. But if you start doing a lot of loops where you're using a lot of CPU and taking many seconds to return a result, which would basically slow down your app and slow down other people's apps as well, since you would be using a lot more resources for your app, eventually your application will, um, we will notice all of these high CPU requests and then those requests will be blocked until your application cools down and stops making those high CPU requests. Now, purely for the time of API calls that run, we don't currently have a limit on that beyond five seconds for an API call and 10 seconds for an individual request. But usually, the, the goal is to try to use a small amount of resources to answer quickly so that your application can scale as your app gets bigger and you get more traffic. The same situation, same limit. Are uh, for, when, for complicated queries to the data store? Uh, or complicated queries? Yes, yes. Uh, complicated queries to a bunch of data. Oh, I see. Well, you know, actually, so most of the queries within the data store are designed so that none of them are um, too complicated. They basically, they all have a very controlled order of running time so that your application can scale. Because, you know, that's a big problem. If you have requests, if you have a data store query that was too slow, it would start to slow your app down. And you can still, um, you know, hurt yourself in other ways if you do an n squared query, for instance, you know, or queries that are based off other queries and so forth. And at that point, then you'll start to hit the high CPU limit. But we do keep track of the CPU used by your data store request as well, and that goes into the calculation not of the high CPU request, but of the CPU your application uses as a whole. So, sure. Yeah, I, uh, I'm very interested in this. 
That's great. To support uh, spatial indexes in the data flow. Special so cases. Spatial, spatial. Yeah. Spatial. Oh, spatial data. So we don't support spatial data as a innate type, an innate type within App Engine. But there are a lot of ways that you can represent spatial data within App Engine, and people have done various efforts on that. Generally, um, you know, most people. If you're an expert on spatial data, then you probably know all of those things anyways. But, you know, various uh, algorithms of coming up with different overlay grids of being able to lift things up and so forth work well. Additionally, with App Engine, one of our sort of deeper down, some of this stuff will be covered in John's talk, and there's great documentation online. We support queries that are arbitrary over properties so that you can do uh, what's known as like a merge join on the results. So that allows you to say, like, oh, well, if it's in this grid exactly, this grid exactly, and this grid exactly, where all of those grids could be a very large set, we can still efficiently return the results. So I think, you, I think it is, uh, works well for spatial queries and for spatial data, but we don't uh, support those uh, innately within the data store. Some more questions? I'm glad to answer them. Anything that, yeah? yeah. You support commercial applications. Is there any restrictions about uh, the classes of applications that we can run? That's a great question. Um, there is not. Uh, there, outside of a few legal restrictions of applications which are patently illegal and so forth, um, your data is your own. Your code is your own on app, on app Engine. You retain all intellectual property rights. You retain all rights to the data and all of that. So basically any sort of application, even if that application is very similar to or a direct competitor to other Google applications. Maybe if you came up with a great calendar application, that's great. We'd love to see it on App Engine. App Engine is really about a platform for you guys to run your applications. The reason why we care at Google, why we want you to have this platform and make it easier for you to create web apps is because as you heard in the talk this morning, when the web benefits, when more people are using the web, more people are using the internet, more people are spending more time online, Google benefits. And we think by making it easier to create these apps and scale it out there, we make that possible. So yes, you know, within legal restrictions, any sort of app is possible on App Engine, and we really encourage that. Some more questions? Got to be, got to be some more questions. I just have examples of some file systems for applications built on App Engine. Oh, sorry, what? Uh, some examples of highly successful oh sure uh, so some you saw in the talk this morning one was um, buddy poke which is the largest open social application today so it's got a, quite a bit of traffic um, and they you know I talked with the developer of buddy poke recently and he remarked how easy it was for him to create the application and go to being so huge without having to keep redoing his infrastructure which all of his peers were doing um, some other big apps there's another uh, online application called uh, Pixverse. It was actually acquired. It was built on App Engine and acquired by High Five sometime in the past. So people have also sold businesses. Um, but I have some other demos open I can show you. Um, so this is a cool app uh, called Rotsi. It's a startup. Um, and it takes pictures from your phone. It receives pictures from your phone that you send it and allows you to sort of do some picture sharing from the iPhone and so forth, which is pretty cool. Um, Another application which has been pretty successful on App Engine is um, the Now Playing application for the iPhone. Um, it was, for a while, in one of the top 20 applications in the iPhone store, and it basically shows you movie show times and lets you purchase tickets instantly. So that's been working out well for that developer. One other example, if you competed in Google Code Jam 2008 this year, that was also running on Google App Engine. At Google, we've started using App Engine ourselves because App Engine makes it so easy to get applications launched and scale easier than uh, a lot of other systems that we use at Google. Another cool example that I like, and this application's not hugely popular or anything, but I think it's a great example of what you can do on App Engine, how it makes things easier, is this app, um, which is a virtual microscope app that someone at the uh, NYU School of Medicine created. Um, and this app is pretty neat. It basically allows you to take slides, so I'll just pick one from the side. This is all running on App Engine. Hopefully my network connectivity does not go out. And it allows you to, to take a slide, which they've scanned in, sort of does Ajax stuff or panning around, zooming in and so forth. But then when you're looking at the slide, 
it already comes marked with markers, which indicate which things are. So I can click and see, oh, this is worm and gut lumen. I mean, you can see how this would be really useful for a class and sharing data and so forth. But it's also the sort of app where, you know, you might be able to write this. And I bet this, uh, the author of this app is really excited. I've never met this author, but he's excited. He didn't have to support the machines to run this. And if he gets slashed on it, maybe if all of you guys are excited, it's still okay. I don't have to worry about hurting his app here, as I showed around. Some more questions? Some more, anything? Tough questions? Do you have one? Oh, sorry. Maybe there's some support for bigger corporations like we have development team here, and our management wants to develop some applications. And we like App Engine, so why not? And can you say, okay, this application will be restricted somehow for this company, and we will we will supply you with this data and so on and so on. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something. That's something you can do with App Engine today. Uh, with Google Apps for your domain, which allows you to run, in instance, Gmail for your company or so forth on your own domain, we can use that as an option when creating an app. You can use that as an authentication restriction in your application so that it, can only, it is only available to people on that domain and they always have to log in. So that makes it sort of like using Gmail or something for, for doing that. So that's one way that some corporations are using it today to do that. Uh, is there some, uh, let's say, marketing support? Uh, let's imagine that uh, I'm some, I don't know, IT manager somewhere, and uh, I have to sell this idea to, to my top manager. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, may I request some marketing <laughs> support? That's a great question. You know, I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, I don't I don't work in marketing, but actually you can talk to me afterwards and I could hook you up with uh, the people who do marketing for Google Apps for your domain. And I think they do have great materials. So this is sort of the same thing, whether it was Gmail or not that you wrote on App Engine. So I think they might have stuff on that. Some more questions? Well, okay, it seems like it's it. So uh, a little later this afternoon, we'll have the Code Lab if you want to try out building an application with help from, from us. And then Don will have the advanced talk later if you want to see some really nitty-gritty details on how Big Cable works and how all these details work. So great, thank you. Feel free to track me down during this conference or afterwards if you have more questions or you want to talk about your company or startup or anything. I'm here for you guys. Okay, looks like we're uh, we're all we're all set now. So, um, so Dover then. Uh, my name is Andrew Bowers. I'm the product manager for Google Web Toolkit, and I want to talk to you today about um, performance, both performance in Google Web Toolkit, but also in AJAX and J. 